This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dee Dee Sharp, and welcome to this an AWARE profile. We're glad to have you right there with us. Many Americans will remember hearing about the Mariel boat lift either because they remember the newscast, they studied it in school, or through the movie in 1983 called Scarface and Tony Montana's famous phrase, say hello to my little friend. But the Cuban boat lift was much more than a movie and a popular phrase. It was about one of the most epic milestones in Latin American history, a mass exodus of 125,000 Cuban refugees who escaped the communist regime of Fidel Castro to find freedom and hope right here in the United States. On this AWARE profile, we go one-on-one, -on -one, up close and personal, as we feature the story of one man's incredible journey during the 1980 Mariel boat lift, and 30 years later, as he risked returning to Cuba in search of family and friends that he left behind. For 30 years, I dreamed of returning home. From the very moment I had last seen the mountains of Cuba, fade in the distance, as we sailed north towards Key West, I had thought of nothing more. Now, I was on my way back to Cuba, about to set foot in my own country. The feeling was indescribable. Here it was, at last, the final leg of a very long journey. And that journey is what leads Dr. Jose Garcia, department chair of the Modern Language Department at Florida Southern College, also an author and courageous award-winning filmmaker, to this, our aware profile of Voices from Mariel. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Garcia. Thank we you. We are so glad to have you here with us. You are a survivor of the 1980 Mariel boat lift. This is an incredible, dangerous journey for the people like yourself, Cuban refugees who were fleeing Cuba to come to the United States over 30 years ago. Tell us, what was that like? It was a, it was a very traumatic, traumatic and dramatic experience in, in, many, in many different ways because uh, approximately 125,000 Cubans left their country uh, within uh, uh, six months. And it was probably the biggest exodus in, in Latin America's, uh, in modern Latin American history. Uh, and my, I left when I was 13 and uh, as you can imagine, that is a very uh, crucial age in anybody's uh, development, and that really uh, affected me in many ways. And years later, here I am, I decided that I wanted to rescue the history of the, uh, of the Mario Bull lift in a documentary and, and in a book. And, mm. and that's what I've done, and that's what I've uh, been doing for the last uh, two or three years of my life. And then you went back, 30 years later, to seek out family and friends who didn't make that boat lift? They're still in Cuba. That's what was that? Right. That was very dangerous too. Again, it, it was it was dangerous. I mean, it was uh, dangerous, but it was something that had to be done. Uh, it had to be done for many different reasons, and primarily is the fact that uh, a documentary of this size and this comprehensive had not been done. And one of the uh, things that was missing from anything that has been done on the Mario boat lift is. As one of the Marielitos or, or Mariel boat lift refugee going back to Cuba and talking to the people that were there, the people that actually stayed behind and talking to them and, and reunifying with family and friends and I wanted to do that. Uh, so in the process of working in the book and in the uh, documentary, uh, we decided that we wanted to go back without telling anybody what uh, that we were coming back and see if we could capture those voices and ca capture those, uh, uh, go see, like, I, like you can see in the, fi in the uh, film, go back to my, my uh, neighborhood, go back to uh, see my family without them knowing that I was actually even coming back to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, In just a moment, we're going to talk about some of your emotions as a little boy coming over and some of your emotions going back as a man and what you were thinking. But first, I want to go back to the top of our opening of the program today. As you know, many people will remember accounts of the 1980 Mariel boat lift through the 1983 movie Scarface, which is what I just mentioned. That movie starred Al Pacino. 
Pacino played a Cuban refugee named Tony Montana. Montana became a drug cartel kingpin during the cocaine boom. Tony and his best friend, Manny Rivera, played by actor Stephen Bauer, portrayed a negative image of Cubans who came to the United States through the boat lift. They portrayed criminals and drug traffickers. And it was reported that Fidel Castro even intentionally allowed such criminals and individuals who were even mentally ill to be sent to America as part of the boat lift. But as Bauer explains, there were many more positives in this than there were negatives. Check them out. These are decent, hardworking people, courageous people, like this film's Jose Garcia, who after 30 years in the United States, risked everything by going back to Cuba to find out what happened to those he left behind. You know, some movies are fiction. And in Scarface, Manny is a flawed hero. But as I got to know the real heroes of Voices from Mariel, I felt proud to have played a character who, like them, risked it all for freedom. And so, Dr. Garcia, you got a chance to interview Stephen Bauer and get his take on this, and, and we just got a chance to hear what he had to say about this. But as we go back and we think about what was going on with Fidel Castro's decision to kind of intermingle in the group of people like yourself, um, good, decent uh, Cubans who wanted to come to America for freedom and an opportunity, he mixed in there a lot of undesirables and that sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about some of those people who were coming, and then let's get back to, you know, some of your personal um, aspects of this. Uh, it, what happened in 1980, it was, it was significant for many different reasons, and it was uh, primarily is the fact that Cuba in 1980 was considered uh, a utopian society. Uh, it was a country with supposedly their citizens got free health care. Uh, there was very little crime. Uh, so a lot of, it seemed from the outside, it seemed like Cuba, there were a lot of good things happening in Cuba. And if you know a little bit about the history of the Mario Bull lift, uh, how the whole thing began, uh, six Cubans got into a bus in 1980, crashed a bus into the embassy, and uh, Fidel Castro, the Cuban government, decided they were not going to offer any protection uh, because in the process, one of the guards was killed. And Within 48 hours after the Cuban government had taken the guards away, approximately 10,000, over 10,000 people uh, jumped the fence and got into the embassy. So the image that was sent to the rest of the world was that uh, a lot of questioning. How, how is it possible that such a perfect society where uh, the citizens get free health care, uh, they have the right to have an education, uh, if they have all these benefits, great benefits, why would so many Cubans be willing to abandon the country and leave it all behind. And now for the first time, we were not talking about the Cubans that have been, uh, as in the beginning of the revolution, that have been probably mostly the, the wealthy, the professionals. These were Cubans that had been either born or grew up with the revolution. That in 1980, uh, in that particular, in this particular historical event, they decided they wanted to break away with the, the system. So getting back to your question, uh, to the Cuban government, that was a very negative uh, thing that was happening. It was projecting an image that was not the image that existed up until that particular moment. And uh, they figured, well, why don't we try to stain that image? Uh, and we're going to tell the world that the people, that most of these people that are living are actually the filth, uh, criminals, uh, prostitutes, uh, the scum of Cuban society. When in reality, the people that were living were people that had been born with the revolution or people that simply uh, in 1980 decided we're done with the system, we're done with what is happening in Cuba, and we want to go somewhere else. Uh, and one thing that I want to make sure that is clear, uh, when they got into the embassy, the idea was not to just leave for the United States. The idea was we want to get out of Cuba. Uh, and in the process, what the government did is they, it is true, I mean, it is factual information. They show it up at the prisons and they gave the prisoners ultimatums. They went to the uh, mental institutions and they told the people, you're gonna have to get on a boat and, uh, and you're gonna have to leave the country. So uh, in reality, approximately, it is estimated that approximately 2,500 uh, common criminals left the country. But it's not, uh, it wasn't 
most, it, keep in mind, 125,000 people left. Mm -hmm. So that was a very small percentage. However, that small percentage really stained uh, the whole exodus and the image that because was... Because it put a negative stigmatism exactly. on everybody, even though we're only talking about a couple of bad apples here and there. And I even personally, barrel, so I even personally experienced that as a kid. I mean, I remember the image that existed, not just from, from Americans, the image that existed even among Cubans that were already here was anybody that comes in the Mario boat lift, Marielitos are probably old criminals. And I had, I remember I was only 13 and a half when I left. I remember in those days, people asking me if I had been in prison in Cuba. And uh, as you can imagine, well, I mean, that's a possibility. You could be in right. prison at that young, but it's not very common for, right. for somebody right. at that age. And, and, and I know that must have been very difficult for you to have right. somebody be so, asking you a question so like the, that. The first thing, whenever, it, it is interesting because the first thing that popped in my mind when somebody asked me, so when do you get here? Uh, after I had said that I was Cuban and I said, well, I came in the Mario lift, I could just see it in their mind, in their face. I mean, I could see it in their faces that what triggered that answer was what it was, well, this guy is probably not one of the, so, uh, the good Cubans. This is uh, questionable, you know, the questionable mm -hmm. Cubans, that, uh, w which is pretty sad. I mean, I felt that, and I'm sure thousands of other Cubans that, um, that left in the Mario Bowl lift, uh, Mm -hmm. I felt the same way. Let's let's go back to some of the emotion that you felt because you write about it in your book. We'll talk about the book in a second, and we see it in the documentary. If you see the documentary, and hopefully you will, this is it was an emotionally charging time for a teen and others like you on that boat, as well as the other people, the elderly and, right. and other people who were there. The, the the stories that are being told, voices from Ariel, are just overwhelming some of them in the things that people experienced trying to get here. Tell us a little bit about your personal journey. Uh, for me as a kid, it was a very traumatic moment. You can imagine, uh, as far as I can remember growing up in Cuba, uh, fear is, is a constant. You, you live with fears. As far as I can remember, I always have fear. Uh, I had to be scared. I had to be careful. Uh, your parents and this happens with many families, you know, they basically tell their children, whatever you hear at home, you cannot tell people outside the house, outside the home, because you could get us in trouble. So fear was a real factor. Uh, that fear became even more intense in my case as the Mariel Bull lift, uh, when the Mariel Bull lift began. Because then all of a sudden, for the first time, uh, it was out in the open that I, we might leave the country. And uh, one of the things that started happening is uh, what they called the acts of repudy. Uh, the acts of repudy basically worked was a way to attack the families that were living. Uh, they, people would show up at the house, people that the government basically uh, prepared. We show up at the house, not dressed in any military uniforms or anything. Just They looked like just average people. In fact, myself, I even uh, attended one of those uh, rallies uh, because they went to the school and they said, we're going to go uh, demonstrate our support for the revolution and we're going to go to such, uh, such and such house and we're going to, you know, call names and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I remember... So it was trying to intimidate people. To intimidate people, uh, to show in a way uh, a support for the revolution, how... Uh, and that is something you had to participate. In a society like that, you had to participate. I remember attending, ironically, one of those... Uh, acts, one of those acts of repudy, one of those demonstrations, and uh, you can imagine the fear, thinking, you know, there's a possibility that I might leave the country, because I, my uncle had gone to Cuba to pick us up in a boat. There's a possibility that what I'm doing here, because I was told that I had to be here, uh, could be happening to me within a short time, within a few days. So you can, Im you can imagine the intense fear uh, that I lived under, uh, and that was only part of it. Then that fear uh, when people read the book and see the documentary, intensify because of my family, my specific uh, family background. Mm -hmm. uh, and the job that my father had, that was a job that was pretty, uh, a, a well-connected job. And the fact that he was going to leave the country uh, really put him in a predicament because he could have ended up easily in prison. Uh, we had to go through uh, falsified papers. We had to basically have a plan, decipher a very careful plan so that we could actually leave the country without any uh, repercussions. And getting into the specifics, uh, as the day that we actually left my town, we were waiting outside the town, outside the gates of the town, 
and all of a sudden I see a motorcycle, uh, two policemen in a motorcycle coming towards us, a group of uh, people that were uh, going to leave. There were approximately 50 people there. So we see this policeman that show up, and then they start calling out a name. It was actually my father's name, the mm -hmm. only person they were calling. They wanted to see my father. And the idea was, and at that particular moment, I, this is something that I'll never forget. They say, well, we have some questions. We don't know who gave you permission to leave the country. How do you manage to do this? We need you to come with us. I will never forget my mother uh, getting on the ground, sitting on the sidewalk, and breaking down, crying, uh, saying, we're going with you. And my father saying, no, just stay here. Just leave if you have to leave. And I remember that. And it was pretty traumatic. To make a long story short, they took him away for uh, approximately half an hour. Uh, but my father had uh, dual citizenship. His parents were Spanish immigrants. Okay. And as a result of that, they said, you know what? Uh, we don't know what's happening. Maybe he's got permission from higher up. We're not going to get in the middle of this. And uh, they brought him back half an hour later. But to me, that felt like uh, a much longer time. Right. And, and it an, was eternity. A very, yeah. an eternity. It was a very scary moment. And uh, uh, then after that, the whole process, I mean, the next three or four days, uh, before we arrived in the port, every time we went through a police uh, checkpoint, uh, I was wondering if my father was going to be arrested right at that point, and this was going to be the end of it. Okay. So. We're talking about the Mario Boatlift of 1980. We're talking about the fact that at some point with this, as the, uh, the, the six people in the van go through the Peruvian embassy gate, and the Cubans shoot. One Cuban guard is shot. That's this right. Is, this is according to That's your story. Right. And then, long story short, uh, Fidel wants these six people who went through this gate to be punished. That's right. But they had, at that point, the security and the protection of the embassy. And once many people saw that they were going to have that, overnight, there were more than 10,000 people on that embassy soil at that point because they wanted the same thing. That's right. Fidel then, Castro, decides to go ahead and open up Mariel, the port of Mariel, to allow people who wanted to leave to leave. But there was only a six-month window. Am I right? That's right. Yep. You and 125,000 other people are in this group. That's with right. With some undesirables as well. More than 1,700 Cuban-Americans, Americans, whomever they were, came over there to get you. That is right. Those boats were filled with 125,000 Cubans all taking that 90-mile journey. You've heard many stories. Your documentary, your book, Voices from Marielle, are those voices of some of those people. That is true. Tell us more. That is true. Uh, and you're bringing up a point, as you were saying, that, you know, that uh, many times we, uh, the Cuban refugees are left in 1980 don't recognize, and we need to think in public, you know, publicly, and that is... The, the U.S. Coast Guard, they played a huge role. 125,000 people left. Uh, had they not been as involved, it, as I understand that is the biggest uh, operation in, in the U.S. Car, uh, Coast Guard history uh, since uh, the end of World War II or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, many times we don't recognize them, and I think maybe this is one of those instances where I, where I should be talking about that is the people, the American soldiers that put the you know, their, their life in the line to help these Cubans and make sure that these people didn't drown in the middle of the ocean because when you see the movie, as you notice, uh, almost every single boat that left the port of Mariel had twice the amount of people that it was supposed to hold. So had these people not come to the that rescue... That made it just that much more dangerous. Exactly. I mean, yeah. it could have been, it could have been a genocide in a and way. And some people didn't make it. And some people, people did not died, make it, and, and it is impossible to know how many people might have died in the middle of the ocean. You know, uh, uh, there's a few recorded instances of one of them where the whole family died, and only one there was only one girl that was a survivor, which mm -hmm. is a horrible experience. Uh, so you had the uh, the Coast Guard, then you had the Peruvian uh, diplomats. The Peruvian diplomats in Havana could have easily said, you know, we're gonna just go ahead and turn these people over to the. Uh, Cuban authorities and, and get it over with, and that would have been the end of the story. But they did not do that because they were, uh, they had the moral, uh, you know, uh, principles to say, you know, we respect the right to political asylum and we are not going to turn these people over because we know the consequences. 
So the Cuban government reaction was, well, if you're going to play that game and you're not going to turn them over because they are responsible for the death of a guard, when they were not, because the guards actually, they, the guard that was killed was actually in the crossfire. Uh, the Peruvian, the Peruvian uh, diplomat said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to return them. And they stood their ground. And the Cuban government said, OK, well, so we're going to open the gates. Uh, where you're not going to have any protection. Little did they know, and this is, I am convinced of this, that that many people, within 40 hours, over 10,000 people jumped that fence and said, we want to get out of here, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have, you know, again, the Peruvians, uh, the, uh, the diplomats, uh, the Peruvian diplomats. We have the people in uh, the U.S. Coast Guard. And then you're right, as you well mentioned, the Cuban Americans that uh, volunteer that left, literally dropped everything and went down to, to Key West to help their fellow brothers that were coming from Cuba. And, and these are people that we, uh, I am personally very grateful to them. And many times uh, we don't recognize their, their efforts and what they did for, for us. Uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of thank yous to a lot of people yep. who, yep. who were and involved is, in this. Uh, and I'm really glad that you brought it up because I had not been <laughs> publicly I don't think I've ever said it before. So. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it, okay. right here on the Aware Show. Great, you got a great. chance to say thank great, you. <laughs> great, great, great. Well, you know, we, we look at this and, you know, we look at the fact that at that time, what you say is that Fidel Castro meant for some of this to be have a negative stigmatism, as we mentioned, with the criminals element and, and this sort of thing that, that were sent over with this group of people. That was negative, and it and it also backfired on him. Tell us a little bit about how this kind of blew up in his face, too, do you think? That uh, he thought that he was sending in, you know, all of these undesirables over here to the United States, but, but in fact, this, this may have backfired in his face. I know it has political ramifications here in this country because in 1980, we know that former President Carter was not re-elected that year. That's he right. lost to uh, Pres uh, President Reagan. But how did, uh, Ronald Reagan, how did this actually backfire for Castro, you think? Uh, for Castro. many people came over here and made it. They were successful. Right, right, right. Yeah, most of the, most of the Cubans that came, I think, were average uh, people. I mean, they were, uh, a lot of them are very successful. They've done uh, well. But there's a lot of other people that are hardworking Cubans that came. Uh, and that's one of the things that I tried to do in my book. I try not to concentrate on the ones that are wealthy and extremely successful, I think. You got people from all kinds of backgrounds of Cuban society that came. Mm -hmm. And are hardworking, productive citizens that have raised families, have sent their children to uh, to college, that have done very well in this country. Uh, one thing that that I like to mention, though, that we cannot forget, though, there was an element that was sent, uh, as we mentioned before, that were criminals. I mean, there was a percentage that were criminals, and and th some of those guys at the very beginning, if you read the literature, committed some uh, pretty uh, bad crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to mention that, you know, because I think it is. important important to recognize that uh, as a form of respect for the families, that American families that suffer right. because of this particular history, you know, historical right. uh, uh, incident. Uh, but I think, how did it backfire? I think, as I mentioned previously, uh, for the very first time uh, in the history of the Cuban Revolution since 1959 until 1980, all of a sudden there is a questioning as to what is going on in paradise. Okay. Because Cuba was supposed to be paradise. You had American politicians in the 1970s, late 70s, saying, you know, the Cuban model, it's, it's working great. Look how... Yet everybody's trying to leave. It looks like a yeah, lot of people well, are trying to get out of here. Until 1980, yeah. I mean, because again, like as I mentioned, the Cubans that had left up until 1980, until the Mario Bull left, have been mostly the very well off to do Cubans that had left at the beginning of the revolution and the professionals. So the, what people looked at is, well, you know, the people that left were the bourgeoisie, the, the rich, but the average Cuban citizen is happy in Cuba. Uh, 1980, the Mario Bull lift puts that into question, you know, uh, the socialist uh, model that has been implemented. These people who were born there, yeah, they're not rich, yeah. but they want to leave. Right. So, I mean, and that's it, how... And surprisingly to him, to find probably 125,000 Cubans... That's right, that are willing at, to... At, at that Mario you know, pier to get to get right. out of there, right. you know, at that port to get out of there at that point. A uh, lot of intimidation for them, not only from Cubans in their country, but in, probably in America, in the United States, too. So you took it both ways. You took, 
you took the criticism from Cubans who probably thought you were traitors or that's right. you know you, you know you're turning against your government then you're coming to the United States and and we're looking at uh, you know they're bringing the criminals, they're bringing the prostitutes, they're bringing the mentally, they're right. bringing all this on our country. So, and even though you're not that, some of your, you know what I mean, out of that 125,000, a very small percentage is undesirable at that point. But you're taking that negative, uh, negative um, image from both your country and to some degree this one too. That's it's right. been very difficult. Right, yeah, it was, it was a, literally a double hit. I, I think it was, probably more difficult for Cubans to make it in this country, Cubans and Marielitos, Mario Bo lived refugees, than it was for any other Cubans before uh, or even after because we had that stigma. I mean, uh, if you read my book, uh, in some of the interviews, I remember some of the Marielitos uh, looking for job, looking for work, and whenever they put out there, I, I came in the Mario Bo lift, uh, automatically they would not be able to get the job. So many Marielitos over the years, and it hasn't been until recently, that would lie and say, no, I actually left Cuba through Spain, or I left uh, in a different you know, year uh, to sort of get away from the Mario Bo lift uh, stigma. You know? In my case, I was, I was a kid, and I never, honestly, I never felt uh, that I had to hide anything. And I always, uh, and I remember several people uh, over the years telling me, you know, you're so proud to be a Mario Bo lift refugee. You say it so with no qualm whatsoever. You're not intimidated to say it because I look at it as the opportunity that my family had to leave Cuba. So to me, the Mario Bull lift is not something negative. It was op opportunity to come to this country and, and have a new life. And especially for my father uh, that uh, you know, was very young when, when Castro came into power and his life was completely changed by that. Mm -hmm. so. now, we, we talk about the Mario Boat Lift of 1980 and those who came then, but just in 1960, you had the, the the Pedro Pan kids who came. Now I know this is like is different from what we're talking about with Mario Boatlift, but yet we had people fleeing a yeah. number of children at that point getting out of there. Can you just hit on that? I know that doesn't have anything to do with Mario, but it just lets us know that people were in this flight from Cuba and had been going on for years. That's right. Since 1959, I'm, in fact, I'm going to bring it a little closer to my own experience. My, I was only a few months old when my grandparents actually left Cuba. So I literally grew up as a kid in Cuba without my grandparents. Okay. Uh, my maternal grandparents left in 1967. And then my grandmother, the only one that was left in Cuba, was he, she was a Spanish immigrant, left in 1970. So from 1970 up until I left Cuba, I grew up, and there are thousands of Cubans and uh, children, Cuban children that have lived this sort of experience, that the, somehow the family was fragmented. You know, some people left for one place and the other, others left for another. So that is one of the tragedies of, of uh, the Mario Bull lift and what has happened, happened since 1959. You know, uh, there's approximately over two million Cubans that have left uh, the island supposedly since 1959. I mean, a lot, a lot of people have passed away but right now, there's approximately two million Cubans that have lived in exile, live outside of Cuba. So mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a very traumatic experience. Uh, I travel a lot. I go to Spain every year. I take students to Spain. And we sort of Cubans are so used to that that we don't realize it until somebody else brings it up. And I remember telling other people, either in the US or when I traveled to Spain, and they tell me how sad that you know, you guys, uh, your families are completely fragmented. Some people are in Cuba, some people are here. Uh, it's, a, it's a tragedy in many, many different and, ways. And you say that in your documentary. You say that in many ways this was like the parting of the water that divided your nation, your lives, into a before and an after. That's very powerful. Yeah. When you put that there. I, I, I feel like I had, I, I almost lived two lives. Uh, they, you know, when you're growing up, I would say uh, the first... I'm convinced of that the first 13, 14 years of your life are very, very important. Uh, that is, that's, that's sort of the founda foundation of who you're going to be for the rest of your life. And I have to say that I have my foundation set up in Cuba and then my development in, in the U.S. So uh, I feel like I've had, you know, two lives in, in many different ways. Am I 100% Cuban? I want to feel that. I, uh, you know, it's very important to me to feel that. 
But at the same time, the reality is that I'm a hybrid. I'm, I'm also American in many different ways, and I see that when I go to other places. So. And one of the people in your documentary mentions that she feels like a hybrid. She feels, because she's here in the United States, but she knows that she's Cuban. She came in That's on right. the boat lift. And she, she talks about that, that feeling of not really belonging, because she doesn't really belong here and she doesn't really belong there. I know what that's like, but I also know, too, that at least for her, she does know that home is Cuba. You know, as being black, I know that somewhere in my family tree, it's going to take me back to Africa, but I don't know where in that country. So I'm, this is my country, this is my home, and, I've, and you have to accept that. So you go through life, and I understand, and I can you know, get where she's coming from with that to, to a different degree, but I appreciate it. And now you're yeah. saying it. Yeah. Uh, uh, to me, it is interesting. I didn't realize that I was literally an orphan, a cultural orphan in a way. Uh, I didn't realize how much I needed my country and I needed, uh, uh, I was still sitting in the, just to give you an idea, I was still sitting in the airplane looking out the window, as you can see it in the documentary, when I'm looking out the window, mm -hmm. and feeling uh, a very powerful sensation, you know, and, you know, I travel to other places, I feel very comfortable in the U.S., but this is not where I was, you know, that's not where I was born. My roots are here. This is where I really belong. And it was, in a way, tragic, sad, because I'm sitting there thinking, I don't care what the politics are, this is my country, and I had not even gotten up the, the, uh, the airplane. Uh, to me, there is a before and the after. To be able to go back to my country and see my families and see my, uh, you know, the, the kids that I grew up with when I, when I lived there uh, was pretty intense. And uh, to summarize it, I mean, I dream of the day where I could actually, and people tell me, oh, you're going to go back to Cuba and you don't want to live in the U.S.? Yeah, I do want to live in the U.S., but, but I feel my roots are there. That's where I'm from, and I would love to see a country where I could be part of that country. And I, I dream of the day where I could, you know, when I could contribute to my country and be part of that country that I never had the opportunity or almost a privilege, I guess, in a way, to, so. And one of the voices of Marielle, uh, voices from Marielle in your documentary, he likens it to a woman that you once uh, loved. Right. And he talks about how, you know, you can't have her. You know, you can't be there, but you just long to see her again. Yep. So I, I understand that longing by what you say, how you say yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, I feel uh, it is impossible to describe. I mean, I dream of the day that I want to be, I mean, I, when things change in Cuba politically, I think many Cuban Americans, I, and people say, no, that's not going to happen because they're used to living in the U.S. They're very comfortable here. But I think many Cuban Americans that uh, go back and experience what I experience are going to want to be part of that country again. Uh, Cuba, I really think, is going to feel that it's going to need us, Cuban Americans that, that have lived in this country, and uh, be able to contribute what we've learned here in a future Cuba. You know, because uh, I feel in a way like I've missed out. You know, I was taken away at a very young age, and. Everything that I think about in my life is in hindsight. You know, what would I, my life have been like had I stayed there? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I dream of that day, and you see it in the documentary. Uh, also, I was told many times when I was doing the documentary, uh, when I was about to start doing the documentary, why are you doing this documentary? Uh, if you go back, people are not going to recognize you. They're not going to remember you. Uh, well, it was a complete opposite. Uh, I went back to my neighborhood, and you see it. I don't know if you remember the scene where I'm standing in front of my house to mm -hmm. go into my house yes, and the lady I from did. upstairs. That was amazing <laughs> to, to see them, uh, the, the love and the affection that I felt from my fellow Cubans. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about people in my neighborhood. I'm talking about just strangers yes. from all kinds of, uh, to welcome me in my country was just, uh, was indescribable. And, uh, it's like home, yep. I'm home. <laughs> but at the same time, at the same time, I wonder, you know, yeah. why would these people uh, have never, how come they never had the opportunities that I had? Yes. Uh, you know, they, their lives have gone in a completely different path. They have stayed there. Uh, and I had these opportunities to, to come to the U.S., yeah, through the Mario Ball lift and despite all the suffering and everything, I've had a great life. And it makes you wonder why, how come these people haven't had that opportunity? What have they done differently, you know? Right. I got and you. it's sad and tragic in a way. And I was moved by that.
Yeah. Yeah, you were moved. You yeah. you were trumped up really emotionally a yeah. couple of times in this in this documentary. I Your don't like to cry in public, but I, I yeah. sometimes I couldn't, you know. Yeah. Hold back the emotion, so. No, it's, it's, it's very touching. Yeah. Talking about some of the voices from Marielle, some of the people who you used in your documentary, who were these people? How did you, to come, we're gonna, we're gonna hear some of the voices in just a moment, but who were these people? How did you go about deciding who was gonna be a part of this project? Uh, basically, it was a word of mouth. I would interview someone, and then uh, this other person would recommend a couple of other Marielitos, and, uh, we wanted, again, like as I mentioned at the beginning, is see if we could uh, capture voices from a lot of different segments of society, you know, from different backgrounds, economic and social classes. And uh, so that's how it sort of went about, you know. Uh, and then there's that, that part of the documentary, which is, uh, appears in the documentary, which is the Peruvian uh, voices of the, the people that were uh, the diplomat mm -hmm. and also the only reporter and I can say this, this is factual information. The only reporter that has ever been interviewed that was inside the embassy as the whole, everything started happening in 1980, is, uh, it's in our documentary. Uh, the only reporter that was there, I mean, the other reporters came later, but he was the only one that was there when, when that was happening. Uh, so we have him and then we have the diplomat. That had not been, uh, for whatever reason, those voices had not been rescued before. Mm -hmm. We're gonna hear some of those voices now. And then we'll come back and we'll talk to you okay. a little bit more about them. Here you go. Take a listen. It was exactly the way I picture it. Everybody was there. The paramedics were there. Uh, I remember the guy was throwing the lines into the uh, into the pier to tie the boat. I couldn't wait. I just jumped out of the boat and I twisted my ankle here and I just wanted uh, to be on the ground. I remember I was down to my underwear and my little T-shirt, and uh, I remember my my sister and I. Uh, walked over, um, you know the area where, where they lift the boats and they t put them back on the trailer? I remember walking down there together hand in hand and we decided to wash our feet because they were just so dirty and our, our t-shirts were stained with vomit and, and whatnot um, from the trip over. I mean, it's 90 miles, but it felt like it was an eternity. We were told in Cuba the Americans are bad people. So here we were, I, was be I had been rescued by Americans, I had been taken care of by an American who took it upon himself to be, uh, you know, extra kind to me and my family, and he was not what the government had told me Americans were like. Okay, now I chose to talk, to bring these three people in because there's some points that they make in each of, of their statements. Carlos Morales, when he says he was so excited he jumped off the boat, twisted his ankle. He was so excited because the people who were there to rescue him were there as he thought they would be there. Tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, more about Carlos. Uh, Carlos' story is, a, is very interesting. Uh, he had dreamed, uh, this is a, a guy that was very young when the revolution started. Grew up with the revolution. Uh, 1980, he is a DJ and he is setting up for a wedding or a quinceanera or something like that. And all of a sudden, uh, a kid shows up and says, your mother wants to see you right away. Uh, and that is in the book, and I don't remember, it's not in the documentary, but it's in the book. And all of a sudden, his life changed in a heartbeat because he says, uh, so he goes to see his mother. And his mother says, we have only a couple of hours to get into the embassy. People are going into the embassy. Uh, and he says that at that particular mo moment, uh, he was ready to go anywhere. I mean, this is somebody who had grown up with the revolution that's fed up, I wanted to leave the country. And then once he arrived in, uh, as he mentions in the, uh, in the documentary, uh, when he arrives in Key West, all he wanted to do is just jump and get off the boat. He wanted to step on American soil, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, it's, it's an amazing uh, thing, but at the same time, it's tragic, you know, that somebody that is born, average Americans, most Americans don't want to go anywhere else in the world. And this is somebody who was born in his country, grew up there, and all of a sudden he wants to leave when he reaches a certain age and he doesn't want to be part of that country. Uh, and the same thing with the other, the other uh, young people in the, uh, in the boat. I mean, I mean that in the documentary. It, right. Elizabeth it, Carbello, she says that it was a, only a 90-mile journey, but as she explained it, it sounds horrific. She's glad it was over, but it's because it seemed like eternity, what they were going through. Yeah, that's right. And then you have Patsy Feliciano. Patsy and, Feliciano. And she says that 
much like what we were just talking about, some of the rhetoric that she was she had heard as a child about how bad Americans were and how they would be mistreated over here, that it was nothing like that when she got here. That's right. In fact, um, I've even heard in, 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 in some of my research of doing this, um, some of the people who came over uh, in the Mario boat lift have other stories that they tell about this. And, and some of them are so touching, like some of the ones that you captured in your uh, documentary. One of them said that when she got to uh, on the water and the family was apparently lifted from their boat and they were taken to an aircraft carrier. That's right. And she mentions that she didn't know what was going on. It's just this concrete slab sitting in the middle of the ocean that they ended up on. And she remembers Americans giving her a Coke and an apple. And she looked up to her mother and she asked, what is this? And her mother said, that's freedom. That's right. Th just amazing that, that to the child, it's, it's just Coke and an apple, but to the mother, the mother is trying to explain to her that this is what freedom feels like. That's right. This is it. That's right. You got I it. I mean, it's something that is uh, many times you don't recognize what, you know, my parents. And it is interesting because now when I went back to Cuba, uh, my neighborhood friends and other people had one of the things that they said to me was, you, you got to be very grateful to your parents for the uh, for the sacrifice that they took to to give you a better life. And you have to recognize that. And many times people take that for granted. I mean, the sacrifices that the parents go through. Uh, because, I mean, they're the ones that know what is happening. I mean, at, at a young age, you know, we, we don't internalize those things and we, sometimes we don't realize what's happening. But obviously your parents want the best for you and, and uh, these people need to be very grateful to the parents because they were willing to, to sacrifice everything and leave the country uh, and get on a boat that was over capacity uh, where they could have drowned in the middle of the ocean. They could have perished. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were willing to take that chance. Uh, mm -hmm. In my own case, I don't know if uh, I do mention it in the, in the documentary or if the boat, that first boat that we took started sinking and we had to be rescued uh, by another boat. And I remember uh, seeing my mother and seeing her eyes and, and I could see fear, like wondering, I'll never forget that, what are we doing? Why did we ever do this? And, and uh, those are moments and instances that you can never Especially forget. Especially when you're talking about your children and you're worried about their safety because then you realize you're really in deep at this point and you can't and there's go no back. Going you back. just got to keep going. Exactly. You got to survive You got to keep now. going. And, it's, and she's, she was probably more worried. Uh, obviously, she's more worried about what she's doing to us mm -hmm. as to what she's doing you know, for herself. She's thinking, you know, if I wanted to do this, maybe I should have done it by myself, get on a boat in the middle of the ocean, but not put my kids... Uh, through this, what if, you know, what if something happens, you know, so. One of your Mario survivors, uh, Mario Boatlift survivors that you captured in your documentary says that they think that all of the strength that they had and that they got came from God. They knew that that's where their source was and that's how they were able to Elizabeth, make this happen. Elizabeth Caballero yes, says, says yes, that. Yes, Says that her father, uh, it is interesting because most of these people have a little bit of a history. Uh, Patsy Feliciano, her father was a a political prisoner. Mm -hmm. So she suffered because of that and she wanted to leave the country. Uh, in her case, in the case of uh, Elizabeth Caballero, her father was a, a Christian. He was a, a man that was very much devoted to, to uh, religion. And he was not able to practice religion, so he suffered a lot because of that. And uh, I guess uh, that comes out in that, in that statement, you know, that uh, they're pretty religious. They're very religious. They, mm -hmm. they knew that God was there to help them. So Absolutely. Yeah. We are here, if you're just joining us, we are talking to Dr. Jose Garcia, who put out a, a wonderfully um, made documentary of Voices from Marielle in the 1980 boat lift, Mario boat lift. And you also have a book, too, that you've written. And I think that this book, as you've told us, is a little bit more detailed even than your documentary. The documentary, what, an hour it's minutes, 80 minutes. 80 minutes long. And, of course, the book, uh, how many pages long? Uh, about two, almost 200 pages. About 200 pages long. A little bit more detail than the actual documentary. So if you get a chance to check out the documentary, that's great. But if you get a chance to read the book, you get a little bit more in-depth right. you know, with this. Uh, Dr. Garcia, obviously your wanting to tell your story is what led you to do this. It's what took you back to Cuba and, and took a very dangerous chance with, with risking to go back and, and to tell other people's stories and that sort of thing. This film has 
gone up for some awards at this point? That, that is correct. And tell us a little bit about where you see this going from this point. Uh, ultimately, you know, as an academic, I wanted to, to uh, do this because I felt like I, ha I had the responsibility to rescue this particular part of Cuban American history. Uh, at this point Actually, right it's now, it's American history. It is Cuban, it's Florida history. Right, Florida history, exactly. It is Florida history, it's yes. Cuban American history, and it's a part of history that, ironically, a whole lot of people don't know about. The uh, younger generations don't know about, unless uh, they were, you know, they had a certain age in 1980, a lot of people don't even know that the Mario Ball lift existed, you know, that, that 125,000 people left. The, the documentary has been uh, shown in different uh, film festivals, and we have so far uh, won uh, three awards. We won best uh, uh, best of the uh, audi best audience uh, documentary at the uh, Gasparilla. We won uh, also uh, best of the fest at the Alexandria Film Festival, and we also won best uh, uh, Caribbean film in uh, Aruba at the at the uh, Aruba International Film Festival. But I, I want to bring something uh, that I think is important to mention. And that is the fact that uh, the documentary is something that I could have not done by myself. I had a group of very talented uh, filmmakers from Lakeland, Florida, uh, and Focus, uh, that were the ones that uh, it would have been impossible for me to make this documentary without their help. Okay. Uh, I went to see them. We, uh, they became excited about the story. They jumped on the story. and. Uh, it was, I, I basically say that they became Marielitos in a way, you know, and they went back to Cuba with me to, to the documentary. So that is, a, story. That, is, that is very, very important, you know, to mm -hmm. mention that this is not something that was done just by, by me. I mean, this is right. something that other people were involved in and uh, it would have been impossible to do it without their support We talk about the dangers. Help. We talk about the dangers of you going back and doing this sort of thing. What kind of backlash would you have suffered, could you have suffered in going back and doing this documentary? What, what type of that that's a very that's a very good question uh, that you have encountered uh, that's a very good question and it comes up uh, many times uh, how do you manage to go back into Cuba and do this documentary without uh, government permission because it was I don't know if I mentioned it so far in the interview but it was done without getting permission from the Cuban government and the reason why we did that it was very simple had we requested permission this would not be what it is today because we would have been told, you know, uh, yes or no, you cannot do the documentary, and then it would have never been done, or we would have had somebody taking us around and saying, yeah, you can take these pictures, you can film this, you can film that. Censoring yeah. it. Uh, right, yeah. in many ways. And uh, one of the things that I said is, and I had, I've had this dream for many years, is I, w I don't want to go back to my country as a tourist. I want to go back and capture my return for my children and for the children of the... Uh, 125,000 Marielitos that came that were part of the exodus. Uh, so that's the reason why we had to do it. How did we manage to do it? Uh, it? It is impossible for me to answer that. I still don't know. I tell people we had at, uh, an angel uh, looking over us the whole time. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, something had changed in Cuba. That was not the Cuba that I remember when I left. Uh, okay. That other Cuba, in that other Cuba, I think it would have been impossible to do what we did. Uh, with this documentary. Mm -hmm. And I think it had to do with the fact that Cuba has changed a lot and many times we have people that were uh, there to support us and they, uh, you know what, they were willing to to kind of help us. In, when in you say process. Cuba has changed, how so? Uh, the Cuba that I remember was a Cuba that was, uh, I was, I was always, I grew up with a lot of fear as I mentioned at right. the beginning of the interview. I was always scared. Uh, very careful about what I said. And the Cuba that I saw now, people are talking. Uh, it seems like people are losing that fear. Mm -hmm. uh, people are saying they want something different. You know, they, they try to stay away from the politics because it's not in their best interest. But if there's one thing that they do want to make sure that the world knows is that Cuba is ready for change. Uh, that Cubans want, want something a little different. Uh, because everybody's suffering at this point, you know. Uh, to me, going back to Cuba, it's interesting. That is my own country. I have gone to China, and I remember going to China and feeling that I was a lot closer uh, to the United States than when I was in Cuba because of the restrictions with the Internet, uh, the, the censorship in many ways, 
uh, to make a phone call is it's it's an ordeal to even call the United States. So I felt like I was a lot more isolated, and and you can imagine how mm -hmm. Cubans uh, feel, you know, in the island. So okay, you wanted to go back and capture the human story, not necessarily the political one. That that is true. Tell us about that. I, I wanted to again. I wanted to capture the voices. I wanted to hear what people felt when we left. I wanted to hear if there was some sympathy, or if most people really felt that they had to attack us. Uh, you know what I mean? If everybody was against uh, us when we left. And what I found is that uh, the Cubans in Cuba and the Cubans that are here were brothers, brothers and sisters, and we're, we all have the same aspirations. We all want to live a better life in a better country, you know? Uh, and that's, that's what I found. I wanted to have those voices. Uh, I wanted to stay away from the politics, and I believe me, I did make uh, an effort to stay away from the politics because uh, the politics is something about Cuba and the United States is something that you hear. There's nothing new about that. Uh, and one of the things that I said when we were doing the documentary is, you know, if we start focusing too heavily into the, the political aspect, uh, most people, Americans and non-Americans, are going to say, well, here, are, here is uh, the same story that comes out of Cuban Americans. You know, they're talking about politics, uh, you know, down with Castro or the same rhetoric. And, and I wanted to get away from that. I wanted okay. to capture the, the human experience. Uh, and I think we, in many ways, did that. That's what basically people that have seen the film say, you know, that it's... Uh, I, I've watched this twice. Okay. I watched this documentary twice. I thought it was that good. I wanted to make sure I got it all. And the people that you chose, excellent in the way they described being a part of the boat lift, the way they describe living here in the United States, um, the way they describe wanting to go back home. Um, because in some of the video that I saw, I saw that a stamp of no return was stamped on their That's passports. Right. That's right. So they're not able to return. So, you know, you get an opportunity to return and show them home. That's right. Through what you've done. That's right. Yes. That's right. What can we expect from the, this project at this point, Dr. Garcia? Uh, my, my goal is to use this uh, documentary and the book as, as a uh, educational material to educate people, Cubans and non-Cubans, uh, Cuban-Americans, about this particular part of history. I mean, it's something that cannot, I don't think, should be forgotten. Uh, people, uh, so my goal is for to get it into more universities, uh, more, uh, uh, I started a university tour about approximately a year ago and I've gone through uh, quite a few universities where we have shown the film and now there's the book. Uh, and uh, that's my goal, to, to get the word out, let people know what is what happened in the Mario Bowl lift and the significance of this particular event. But again, I want to mm -hmm. emphasize the fact that uh, the documentary is what it is today because of the talent mm -hmm. also of the filmmakers right. uh, that were able to, you know what I mean, to put yes. that together. Gotcha. Uh, so the documentary, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, was shown in Nat Geo Mundo, which is a Spanish na National Geographic, uh, just recently. And it also has been, uh, it's going to be competing in the Madrid International Film Festival, which is one of us. Uh, we wish you the best with that. Thank you. One yes. of Europe's most uh, important festivals. And it's already been nominated for uh, Best Documentary and Best Editing. So, and that is going to be in July, and we're planning to, to <laughs> go there and, and see. Hopefully, we went there too. So, we're it excited. Good. I'm glad. I'm very I excited. We would be remiss if we didn't give you an opportunity to find out where you can go and get more information about uh, Dr. Garcia's documentary, uh, the Mar uh, Voices from Mariel, as well as his book. And we have that information up there for you for an aware bulletin board. If you'd like more information, then all you have to do is, of course, go to the website that's there at the bottom of your screen. And, of course, you will get the information that you're looking for. And you'll, if you'll take the time to watch this, then you'll really see the impact that this has had, not only on the people who were a part of this boat lift, but here, even in America, as people reached out their hands to help people That's right. um, to survive. And I mean, imagine what you get from knowing that you helped people, these 125,000 people who came over here, that a, a good number of these people became proud Americans. I mean, they've done some wonderful things with their lives. And I was you know, very impressed with some of the people that you use. I think maybe 10? Yep. But there's so many more stories right. out there. <laughs> right, right. I, I think, you know, people talk about the American generosity and 
uh, I have to say it, I know what that's like, and I uh, travel to other parts of the world, and I can, you know, you hear a lot of negative publicity against the United States and Americans this and Americans that, and all I can say is, to us, Marielitos and uh, Cuban Americans that left in 1980, Maria Bull left, the only thing that we can say is that the United States is the most generous uh, country in the world, and Americans are the most generous people, and, and that's something that uh, we're not just saying it's something that we feel, and, and we are very, very grateful, as you saw it there. That doesn't mean that we're not Cubans. We're very proud of our heritage, our ethnicity, but uh, it is undeniable that uh, the United States is a very uh, generous country and that we uh, owe this country a lot. And uh, that's something that I want to make sure my kids remember. Uh, I'm people in, gener in my family for generations. Uh, know that so mm -hmm. and and lastly very quickly this is something that anyone could look at and get a sense of history and and come walk away from this with a sense of understanding about people who have to survive and go through what these people went through what you went through that's right if you had a last word something that you wanted to say to just encourage anyone to just pick up the book and read or just check out the documentary what would that be uh, if you want to see, if you want to learn a little bit about the history of Florida and you want to learn a little bit about uh, this particular uh, historical event, uh, this is a documentary and a book where you're going to find that uh, and you're going to see a lot of positive things, uh, okay. things that we many times take for granted. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Voices from Marielle. It's Thank a you. brilliant documentary that tells the story of nearly 125,000 Cuban-born immigrants who came to the United States nearly 30 years ago as survivors of the Mario boat lift, such as our very own Dr. Garcia, who joined us here for the Aware Show. It's a very powerful and compelling documentary that he has, Voices from Mariel. It follows Dr. Garcia, who, as we mentioned, left Cuba as a 13-year-old boy and then returned 30 years later on a journey of self-discovery to be reunited with his family and his friends who were left behind. And through a series of interviews and memories from several Cuban families, Voices from Marielle pays homage to the many lives that were transformed by this mass exodus of Cubans. The first being those who fled Cuba, leaving behind possessions, family, and friends. The second being those who stayed behind to wonder if they would ever see their loved ones again. And third, the family and friends, as well as politicians and strangers in the United States who reached out to help the refugees who fled Cuba. Their lives, too, were forever transformed. As movie critic Ronald A. Rowe states, if your only knowledge of the Mario boat lift is what was depicted in the movie Scarface, then you owe it to yourself to discover the true story behind this historic migration. There are many lessons to be learned from this documentary. In the end, Voices from Marielle explores the legacy of a brave and courageous people who risked their lives for freedom. They risked their lives for opportunity and risked their lives for a chance to pursue their dreams right here in the United States. In the end, Voices from Marielle is a true story about sacrifice, dignity, courage, and love. And we're glad to have shared that with you. Until next time, I'm Dee Dee Sharp reminding you to stay informed and stay aware.